tutti. Let me give a quick introduction to the, the panel and what this is about. Um, this is really talking to the bigger picture on how society will change and open up and what opportunities and challenges lie in this area. Uh, panelists will answer questions from their specific points of view. As managers of large tech organizations, successful open hardware makers and representatives of the community. Um, so thank you very much. Everyone, we get to the panel in a moment, but by the way, I, I was wondering, uh, what do you think about the music in between? Like, uh, do you hear it? Do you like it, yeah? Thumbs up, show me thumbs up, yeah? And who is thumb thumbs down? Anyone thumbs down? Really? Seriously? So please talk to me later, will you? Yeah? Actually, I wanted to have this music for years. Um, it's uh, uh, Fibucci, yeah? And uh, um, you can check it out. So uh, later it's uh, a lot related to India. And I like the Indian drum rhythms. So I'm very happy we have it. And uh, yeah, so um, always related to uh, tech and, and mathematics, I really like these connections to music. And um, we also have a lot of connections here in this panel. So thank you for joining the panel to the panelists. And I would like to introduce the panelists. Even some have already been introduced. So the panel is uh, titled Business, Government, Science. What opportunities does open bring to society? We really wanted to uh, keep it broad as a topic because there are a lot of different perspectives here in the panel. So next to me is Bunny Huang. Bunny is. Uh, known for the Xbox originally, but that's actually quite a few years ago already. And uh, we've heard a talk from you uh, today. So um, you are also a, a mentor for, for our community here in FOSS Asia. We always like meet you somewhere and try to get some feedback on our projects. So we really appreciate um, uh, your feedback and the projects that you did. And we heard already a little bit from you. So thank you very much. Then, um, actually, I should have done that first, uh, introduce actually Hong Fook, because Hong Fook is the only lady on the panel. It's not that we are not trying, uh, but like we need more ladies in tech, and I'm happy as well, like, just like Harish uh, said today, that um, we have more and more ladies uh, joining. Um, but Hong Fook, you also have um, uh, some feedback on this panel, because you're not just uh, working with the community here uh, in Force Asia, but you also work with companies. Um, uh, for example, uh, work last year there were some uh, engagements here with Daimler. Um, uh, Jonas is here as well, right? Yeah, there yeah. I and uh, um, But uh, also with Zalando and other companies uh, that you're working with. So, so you also have different perspectives to what open means to different players. So thank you very much for joining as well. I think we can also give a round of applause. And also for Bunny. Bunny is also doing good work, right? I mean, like, amazing. So thank you very much. And um, then we have... Um, Shankar V. Selva Durai. Yeah? Um, I'm always getting Indian names wrong, but uh, you told me before we talked before, so I hope I got it right. Yes, And uh, Shankar is uh, the Vice President and CTO of Cloud and, Cognit uh, Cloud and Cognitive Software um, of IBM. And uh, um, yeah, you lead the technical organization that helps clients across Asia Pacific to explore and co-create cloud-based solutions that leverage data analytics and AI capabilities to deliver better decisions and outcomes. Yeah, so I noted it down here for me. So while leading teams varying in size from six to over a thousand, I think very different kind of style, you have to work with different teams. Like, um, so, and you did this in, uh, North America, Europe, and Asia, so a global citizen. Yeah? You also told me that you uh, were born originally in Malaysia, but uh, then grew up in the UK. And then after almost you have a, like, a very long story, so I, I think you have the chance to tell us about this um, a little bit later. Um, but you also hold a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Business Administration. You're, so even here, you also combine different roles. Thank you very much for joining. And we have uh, uh, Dr. Graham Williams here, um, Director of Data Science and, uh, at Microsoft. And uh, uh, Graham has been an open source developer since the 1980s, um, with early contribu contributions to Emacs, Tech, 
Debian also, yeah? So I, I guess you know Martin, yeah? And uh, um, uh, yeah, R, and uh, you are the developer of various machine learning toolkits. Um, he remains a strong advocate for open source and is a practitioner, researcher, and educator in AI. In his current role with Microsoft, he leads a team of data scientists working with business to implement machine learning solutions and to drive open source product development. And you're also an adjunct professor um, at the UC in Can Canberra, um, Australia, and have written many books on the AI topic. So thank you very much for joining. And finally, Carsten Heitzler. So uh, probably many know you, like many who have been to the FOSS Asia Summit before, but also to other events. Um, you, uh, we can meet you at many events, and you worked in Linux and open source uh, industries for 20 years, more than 20 years. But you also started originally actually as a, a community contributor um, to the uh, uh, Enlightenment desktop. Uh, and window manager project, and uh, you have written a lot of graphics related code for X11. Um, and that's 20 years of programming mostly in C and assembly on top of Linux, shipping in, now listen, 100 million devices around the globe. That's something. So, big round of applause. <laughs> so, we see already uh, um, that we have different perspectives. And uh, for me, the perspective was, in 2009, uh, President Obama uh, uh, said uh, that um, uh, uh, openness prevails. So I don't know if anyone was here in 2009 um, and uh, remembers how the time was. It was all about openness. Um, it, uh, there was uh, the Freedom of Information Act at that time, and it was the time when FOSS Asia was founded. So it, it just fitted perfectly into that time, and a lot of politicians were talking about this. And for us, as an open tech community, um, it, it was just natural, it was just logic that uh, we should have open source software, but also like uh, information about how the government is doing, uh, about open science and so on. Things should be, uh, like it should be accessible. Um, and not just out of a theory, because actually out of a collaboration model. We just heard the talk uh, uh, how in Debian it's not mainly only a software project, it's like a global community. You have connections everywhere, you have friends everywhere. So this is very um, natural for us. And uh, the question now is like, what does this panel uh, have, like uh, how's the background of this panel? So openness for us is not just an idea, it is the basis for collaboration in the FOSS community. Um, for example, imagine we all have to sign NDAs, we all have to sign copyright agreements. Would we have ever worked to do together? Maybe many wouldn't have. Yeah? It would just be too complicated um, and uh, it would cause a lot of overhead. So um, it really enables us to collaborate. So, um, in this panel now, I have a few questions, and I would like to get insights into how this idea of openness changes your daily work and changes the work in your uh, organization or in your community or in your life. Um, how it changes uh, your development, your communications, um, tools and technologies, um, how you work together. So, um, I think like we have the biggest contrast here uh, uh, right next to us like uh, bunny comes from a very uh, like open model then also going into business areas um, i saw like some of your projects on uh, crowd supply yeah um, and we have a, another area here which is more from a corporate perspective and i really don't know who to start with first but as you haven't had the chance to say anything today, um, I would like to give Shankar here the, uh, the opportunity to say something first. So about openness in, in um, IBM. I think that microphone should work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Is, it, is it working? Yeah. Can we switch on the other mic? Yeah. No, no. Is it? Yeah. 
Okay, sorry, sorry about that. That's all right. Um, you guys can you hear me? Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, Mario. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, before I start, I just wanted to do a little quick poll here. Um, how many, can you put up your hands? Uh, how many of you are aware of IBM's involvement in open source? Okay, is it 50%? Okay, that's pretty good. I was expecting lower than that. Um, some people may be thinking that I'm here representing IBM because we recently announced the acquisition rate had, so that's that relationship. But actually, um, uh, the, I just want to put in context, right? So IBM has been involved uh, in open source way, way before it was cool or lots of people were talking about it. So this was probably 20 years, 20, more than 20 years ago. Um, in the 90s when we helped establish the Apache Foundation and then the Eclipse Foundation and then the Linux Foundation, right? Um, and, and when we did that, right, we, how we supported the communities and projects was that, you know, first, you know, uh, we either committed money to it. For example, in Linux, we, we committed, uh, invested $1 billion to the Linux Foundation. Uh, we committed, uh, made significant code contributions. For example, the Apache HTTP server, the Eclipse Java IDE framework, and more recently, the Hyperledger fabric, right? Uh, we also dedicate resources to this as well, right? For example, technical resources, uh, engineers, developers to contribute code on a sustained basis, um, as well as uh, lead projects, some of these projects, right? And we also provide legal help for these communities in terms of writing those licenses, as well as supporting them in marketing activities, right? Because we've got to create the banners around open source and some of these projects, right? One interesting thing we also do is that we also arbitrate differences within the community. Um, a good example would be Node.js, right? There's a point in time where the folks in Node.js in community had differences of opinion and they were about to fork, right? And they called, came to IBM and we helped arbitrate so that it came back together, right? So, so those are some of the things that, you know, we've been doing, right? And in the last five years, we've actually ramped up further our investment commitment to open source, right? And, and, and this is from a enabling enterprise capability in open source, all the way from Cloud Foundry to Docker, Cloud Native Company Foundation, Kubernetes, uh, uh, TensorFlow, Node, I mean, hundreds of projects, right? Today, you know, from a, from a, uh, a monthly perspective, right, we're looking for a month, right? we are contributing to about 400 projects in the open source community at any point in time. So that's a real brief around um, IBM, right? Um, so I just want to touch a little bit about, um, you know, how does IBM, you know, what's, 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 why is this important to IBM, right? Um, but before that, let me put in context, right? Um, what's happening in the industry today is that lots of, and I'm, I'm speaking from an enterprise perspective because that's where IBM is focused on. And if you look at that, right, um, enterprises today are, most of them are going through some sort of digital transformation, right? And, and that digital transformation is expected to drive innovation and growth. Um, but the innovation and growth doesn't start with the CXOs, or the guys at the top, right? Um, it fundamentally starts with the developers, the coders, data, data scientists, basically the folks well, here, I mean, you guys, you guys are the ones who are fundamentally driving that innovation and growth. In fact, in, in a recent research, right, um, the study says that 95% of IT impl implementation today are influenced by developers like yourself, right? And, and half of that are actually making buying decisions. So, you know, out of that, whole lot of developers, 50% are contributing to open source, whether in an individual capacity or part of a company, right? So now you know, right, developers contributing open source, driving innovation. So that's kind of in intuitive, right? Innovation, power, drives open source is kind of intuitive. The concept that the, all of us together um, uh, are smarter than any one of us, right? Makes sense. Um, 
and you cannot drive that pace of innovation without a collaborative development effort. But what is not intuitive or not obvious is the economic benefits of open source, right? And let me put that, illustrate to you guys, right? For example, right, in IBM, and I'm bringing IBM context here. We've got IBM engineers participating in these open source projects, right? And they take that, they go, to, go back to our products and put it into our products, and then we enhance it or incorporate enterprise capabilities scalability, availability, reliability, all those things that enterprise need, right? Then we take that product and then sell it, right? And we make profit, right? We make profit, sell it to the customers, the customers come back and tell us feedback, use feedback, or additional requirements. That's where the reinvestment happens. The same engineers go back into the community and now make the project even better and in, in turn make the product better, right? And that drives even more profit, okay? It creates a whole new market because we create a new product. We've got creating more of a uh, shareholder value, right? And that cycle again, right, continues to expand and accelerate. So that's the power of, you know, innovation and, you know, in turn the economic benefits of open source. And in IBM, what we're doing is that, you know, it, open source technology is fundamental to everything that we're doing from a strategic perspective, whether it's cloud, data, AI, even com quantum computing, right? What does that mean? I mean, it means that, uh, you know, open source, open data, uh, open standards, and an architecture that is, you know, uh, open by design. So if you take a look at our cloud platform, you know, we are incorporating, we're trying to drive commonality of platforms across private and public cloud, whether it's our cloud or anybody else's cloud, leveraging containers and Kubernetes. And you heard my colleague earlier on, Rahul, talk about how we are leveraging open source and AI as well. In blockchain, we're driving uh, the uh, leveraging the hyperledger fabric, right? Now, even in, in emerging technology like quantum computing, we have opened up the uh, quantum computing toolkits like QuizKit uh, to the public, right? Uh, and, and this is, you know, I, I think it's, it's critical because even in emerging technology, we strongly believe that the open approach is much better than a proprietary approach, right? So, you know, that's sort of a brief on, you know, why from an IBM perspective, right? I just want to add a couple of more points here, right? So you may be thinking, is this just a vendor play? No, it's not just a vendor play. It's not just a community play also. It is now, I think, it's an enterprise play because enterprises now, large organizations, not just technology providers, are investing in open source because they are realizing the reward and the benefits and reaping the benefits of open source innovation. Right. You know, we look at AT&T, uh, Morgan Stanley, all these organizations, even the space program, right? We look at NASA. They've opened up the code for the Mars Robo program to spur innovation from the 24 million developers that we, we have across the world, right? So, and, and the enterprises are not just doing for the innovation, right? They're also trying to reduce vendor lock-in. They're trying to reduce vendor lock-in, increase interoperability, portability, as well as, and I think fundamental to this is they have access to this mass pool of developers in the open source environment who are driving this innovation for them. So that's a pretty, pretty brief, a little brief around, you know, how, you know, from an enterprise perspective, from a company like IBM perspective, how open source is benefiting this. Okay, thank you very much. That was uh, like, uh, Kind of a good circle from a co corporate perspective, and uh, um, but I also remembered years, maybe not so much IBM, but other companies uh, that had a, a different opinion um, uh, about open source. And uh, Graham is smiling already. 
<laughs> and uh, um, yeah, and uh, like I, I also know your story, right? I mean, we heard about it, like that uh, you have been a contributor for many years uh, to uh, free and open source software. So um, uh, for you personally, this is also a, a very personal story because today you're working for Microsoft. And it would be very interesting to hear a bit uh, of your story, how things have changed over time and uh, how you ended up uh, uh, actually working for Microsoft today and being convinced that this is a good thing, right? Because uh, you really were in the free software community or are a member of the community. And uh, uh, yeah, maybe you could share your personal story. Th thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, so, so I do find myself in a company today that I spent most of my life um, fighting against. Indeed, to the extent that um, I, m m my children grew up with no Microsoft in the household at all. Um, we were a completely open source um, family, if you like. Um, and, you know, I, I, I date my involvement in the open source community back to the 1980s. Um, um, back in the a Australian National University in those days, um, uh, Andrew Tridgell was there with us, Paul McCarris, uh, Martin Schwenke. Martin Schwenke and I, and, and Martin is, is in IBM. Um, Martin Schwenke and I developed one of the first packaging tools for Emacs. Um, and, and given that um, we have precedence of a poll, how many Emacs users are in the audience? Oh, so few. <laughs> how many Vi users? How, how many Vi users? Hey, <laughs> wrong conference. <laughs> um, how many VS Code users? Wow, that's a good number too. How many VS Code Server users? Does anyone know VS Code Server? Okay, so check VS Code Server, the web um, just recently browser-based. Um, all of them are open source tools. So I started off, I, I stuck with Emacs. Um, Emacs can do everything that Vi can do and more. Um, but, okay, <laughs> still alive. Um, and, and still today, um, use Emacs and purely open source stack. I've been involved in the LaTeX tech community as well, setting up um, uh, CTAN, CTAN the precursor of CRAN for R, uh, CPAN for, for Perl and so on. Um, so I, I've spent 30 or more years very much in the open source community. Um, and I brought open source to the Australian government's um, data science uh, capabilities 12 years ago. And it, it's a fairly telling story. I, actually, before I tell that story, let me tell a story from the 90s when I was working with our Department of Health, which really underlined for me why open source is so important. Um, we were developing AI-based systems. My day job is a machine learning researcher, um, AI researcher. Um, we built AI machine learning-based tools for health in Australia, Department of Health in the 1990s. We used a tremendous, a really advanced tool at that time. Um, it was IBM's Intelligent Miner. Um, really nice tool for doing data science, data mining, uh, and so on. Um, we implemented a, a system for the Australian healthcare to identify fraudulent behaviour um, amongst medical practitioners and amongst um, patients. We implemented that system, deployed it. Unfortunately, and, and we had really good relationships with IBM, I should say. Unfortunately, as with many products and any vendor, they decided that that product was end of life. Maybe it was before its time. Um, it was end of life. And we had spent in the department millions of dollars investing in that product. And we came to a dead end. Now we could use the product, but we couldn't develop further on it. We couldn't get into the source and um, maintain it and so on. So we were stuck with end of life. And that was a very costly experience for us. And that really reinforced for me the importance of open source. And another thing I, I, I kind of probably want to get out of my system is, is 
Why do we have F at the beginning of FOSS? And, and the question was raised earlier on today. Um, I, I think a lot of you in the audience were probably sharing with me that, um, hey, actually F is not free as in free beer, it's F as in freedom. And that's the most important thing for me about why open source is so important. Um, it's the freedom that it gives me and my teams and developers to innovate and to use that software in ways that we want to use it. Now, of course, um, uh, and so I was going to tell the story, um, 12, 15 years ago I joined the Australian government from, um, from a research organisation in Australia and they wanted me to build their analytics team. Uh, they had 150 data analysts. I was purely open source, they'd already gone through the um, uh, procurement process, they acquired SAS, um, uh, SAS, I forget what it's called, Miner, something Miner, Enterprise Miner, um, and um, they asked us to come in, I set up a team, mostly open source people from researchers, and they sat us in front of this commercial software and asked us to stop using the open source software that could already do more than what this closed source software could do and just use this commercial product. And it took me three years to build infrastructure, the first open source stack of uh, using Debian um, across Australia. We set up a network of servers running Debian and an open source stack to do data science. And it took me three years and a lot of that three years was spent fighting the IT department, if you like. And the fight with IT was around, hey, we've got a standard operating environment, it's Microsoft. Microsoft is telling us open source software is really, really dangerous. This was the Halloween times. This was um, the Microsoft CEO um, telling open source people how bad we are. Um, we're communists. Um, we are against. Um, American society. Uh, that's probably exaggerating it a bit, or maybe not. Um, but it was a really challenging time to convince our IT departments that actually open source software is so much better and more secure. We can look at it, we can innovate with it, we can change it, we have the freedom to do what we want to do with this software. And that's been my mantra um, forever really, that I want the freedom to do with the software what I want to do, to innovate. So three years ago I was um, finishing up my time with the Australian government um, and Microsoft came knocking on the door and hey, this is, this is ludicrous. Um, publicly I, I'm very anti, very anti Microsoft, um, but they were knocking on the door and it spent some time convincing me that Microsoft today is a very different company. And I'm still there after three years, which still tells me that, okay, I, I'm convinced that there's a massive cultural change happening. And to me, I, I think open source is going, will win always in the end. Um, Microsoft is a very big open source company today. Now, of course, I'm from Microsoft, I'm paid by Microsoft, I'm gonna say that. But I, I stay with Microsoft because I truly see that transformation happening. Microsoft wouldn't buy, wouldn't purchase GitHub if it wasn't in that transformation. Microsoft has always been a developer focused company. It, it kind of wants to be the platform for developers. And previously it wanted to be the platform for developers and make the developers only use whatever they produce. It was a closed platform. It was their platform. It was Microsoft and nothing but Microsoft. Under our new executives, that culture has changed dramatically. It still wants to be the platform of choice for developers. And everything we're doing now is to support developers. How do we support any developers, whatever platform they're developing on? The other side of it, of course, is, is purely commercial. You look at the cloud. What's um, a major percentage of the operating system running on the cloud is open source, is Linux. Um, a major percentage of that is Ubuntu. Um, Debian has a strong uh, presence, of course, Red Hat um, and Fedora also have strong presence in the cloud. People are saying, you know, we want to use Linux on the cloud as well as Windows. 
And hence, from a commercial point of view, from an Azure and a cloud point of view, um, we make money out of Linux on the cloud as well as Windows on the cloud. And that's, that's kind of the um, platform future for, for Microsoft. I have a team of data scientists, machine learning, AI people, um, part of a, a, a team worldwide. There's 60 data scientists in our group. All of our work, all of my work is open source. Um, we work with, with customers. Um, we use R and Python, deep learning algorithms, uh, my favourite, um, uh, and research areas around ensembles and decision trees, all using open source and only open source software working with the enterprise customers. Everything that we learn, most importantly for me, we feed back into the community. So all of the work that we do with our customers, not the intellectual property that relates to the, uh, the, the competitive advantage of the company, but the intellectual property that relates to the technology that we're using to develop that intellectual property for the company, so that algorithmic development we publish in GitHub in open source. We have recommendation toolkits that we publish, computer vision toolkits, um, um, a, a large collection of open source software to support the data scientists. Um, but more than that, we're also trying to see how do we empower everyone to do AI and machine learning. Everyone's talking about AI and machine learning at the moment. Um, I've been in the community for 40 years. This is the fourth surge of interest in AI and machine learning. But how do we get that technology into lots of people's hands? Um, we do that by packaging and sharing things. And, and as I mentioned, um, you know, one of my first ever open source projects was how to package packages for Emacs. I've been involved with um, uh, CTAN, uh, Comprehensive Tech Archive, packaging packages for LaTeX, packaging packages for R, packaging packages for Debian, uh, and so on. I wrote a, um, a, a, a um, utility to support the administration of packages in Debian and Ubuntu as well. So I've always been about how do we package up things to get that out there as easily as possible with um, it, to anybody. And to that extent, um, I, I, I see I, I need to wind up, but to that extent, um, I, I might just advertise Saturday I'm talking about something called mlhub.ai. Feel free to visit it. Um, it's a concept of how do we package up and share all that we learn as data scientists back into the community and in five minutes demonstrate lots of different technology. Um, so I, I invite you to come to that talk and talk to me more um, outside of that. But let me just finish to say um, open source I think has won. Visual Studio Code um, is an open source project widely used by the developer community and the most interesting thing I, I see is Emacs and Vi users going to um, uh, VS Code and telling me I, I'm still Emacs, but they go to VS Code and say this is the best IDE um, that is out there. It's open source and it's got commercial development um, behind it. Um, a little bit of a plug there. But thank you. Well, thank you very much. There were a lot of projects that are open source. It's really exciting. Um, I got the question before uh, when Microsoft will release GitHub as open source. Uh, do you know about it? I mean, yes or no is sufficient. Um, <laughs> I have no internal knowledge. I've asked the question myself too. It's, it's, it's a really interesting thing, plus many other products within Microsoft. There is a, a pipeline of discussion and products that are coming out open source. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, one word I've heard a lot from you was change. And I think uh, um, I would like uh, to talk, uh, to have on book talk about this because you are working with companies, and uh, uh, companies are not. It's not just like that they release code as open source, but it also changes the way companies work. Um, I know that inner source is a big topic um, here. So, what do you observe? What is changing in, inside companies um, when they use open source products and? Um, collaborate with the open source community. How is that going? And uh, maybe there are also some challenges. W what's your view on that? Uh, before I answer that question, I sometimes use Visual Studio Code. I, I'm not a <laughs> So the reason why I mentioned this, 
because I think that the values of force for me is more about collaboration and it really unites unite us together no matter what background or status you are, which level now we are independent from community, from corporation, come from enterprise. It was a changing, a life changing experience for me. I wasn't trained as an, an engineer, but today I don't feel a big gap between uh, a normal person like me and an engineer. When you act inside the open source community, people really collaborative and, and they patient show you what to do. So last week I also write a strip about how to uh, remove duplicate and the different uh, function in, um, in spreadsheets. So, so I feel that I'm also can be a developer. I'm an interested in, in technology, and uh, we don't uh, we, we we don't look at the people based on their status anymore. So you you are here, we're all here together. When you want to, I'm sure that if you want a Bruce, a Senka, or William, maybe you don't meet them in a daily basis, but because of false everyone here is are equal. We are together. We, we, we can do things uh, together. And Mario mentioned that, okay, I'm a female. I should be introduced first. I don't care so much. I just want to be the same as anyone else here. Yeah, we try to be uh, inclusive, make the community inclusive. Um, and um, so what, so back to the question, what I see in companies, a few years back, we focused a lot on the community. So when you call, go into the Force Asia event, you see a lot of developers, but the situation also changing. So companies now, so in some community, they have the feeling that, okay, I only want to, to be close to our developer and company, they always do the bad thing, but it's actually not the case right now. As uh, Sanka or uh, Dr. Rahams already mentioned, IBM, Microsoft, they contribute a lot to, to open source. Uh, 50% of the audience learn about open source uh, at IBM. How about the other 50%? The reason why they did not talk about it so much openly in the past year, but more and more companies started to focus to do more outreach. They want to be connect with the community. And there is a term Mario mentioned, uh, inner source. So what is inner source? Inner source, it applied the concept of open source, how people develop in the open inside company because they believe that when people in different departments and division in the company work together, they can become more efficient. And the, um, I worked um, uh, with Zalando now in, um, uh, in Germany. This is the biggest um, uh, e-commerce platform in Europe, similar to, to, to Amazon, if you know, but uh, focused on, on fashion. And the company actually released a lot of open source. Um, uh, what I learned uh, from them is that sometimes corporation or enterprise, even though they cared about open source, they want to uh, contribute to the community, there's a lot of legal compliance issue that you need to go through, so that delays the entire process. So the trend that I'm seeing right now is that companies work together with the developer community to work on solutions to make things easier for the corporate to contribute to open source. There are also a lot of uh, automatic toolings that allow you, uh, that guiding the do all the compliance check, so that have your internal developers or um, uh, department easily release uh, some um, software to open source. And also, like Sanke, Dr. Raymond only mentioned a lot, there's so many ways, uh, so many um, software that these big companies release online, and they really open not only to push out there for you to use, try to offer the solution, but they really want feedback from the community, help them to improve the solution and work together. So not only you offer something to us, to our community, but we will also work on tooling and solutions that help you to make things easier for the community. So that's what I see, the biggest values in force is to bring people together with our uh, borders, not, not only physically, but in terms of uh, background, in terms of um, position or level. And then I also want to mention here that I have like two people here in the panel that I know for a long time and I really admire, Kasten and um, Benny. So I read about their work online, so they all have their own Wikipedia page, which is really <laughs> amazing. And <laughs> but uh, so, so, so I just feel that a lot to share and we, we can always be in this, uh, the same page. So I don't see uh, the distance in the people who are doing amazing thing, and the normal person like me. So I really appreciate what force can bring us together and give us the opportunity to be connected. Um, I think that Bunny and, and Kasten has more to share. Oh, 
Okay, my turn. Uh, since everyone here gets to ask questions. Um, so, okay, I work at ARM these days. Um, one of the reasons I work here is, or there, it's not actually here, um, is that I have spent 10 seconds, <laughs> um, is I've spent a lot of my life by now doing open source. It was accidental. I never joined it because I wanted to. I barely knew what it was. I wrote a window manager for me. I really didn't care if anyone used it. I thought it was cool. Then someone saw the screenshots and said, we want it. I went, OK, all right, here's a tarball. I went, oh, but it's a binary. I don't want that. Can you give me source code to compile it for my Spark or some other system? I went, OK, here's some source code. Um, and I accidentally stumbled into it. Lo and behold, today, the gen, my work on that software that's gone on is now running in hundreds of millions of devices around the world. Um, and most of those devices now use ARM CPUs. Um, so ARM, the company I work at, we design intellectual property. Reality is that almost everyone in the room here is not our customer directly. You don't buy stuff from us. The people who buy stuff from us are worth billions and billions of dollars and they make chips. So who here is using an ARM CPU in their daily life? Who here thinks they're not? Okay, all right. That, that answer. Reality is everyone uses it whether you like it or not. And our customers really demand open source. That is what almost all the things we make run these days in most volume. We build everything from, we design everything from server level chips. So reality is that one of the top 500 supercomputers in the world is in fact ARM based. Um, all the way to everything in your pocket. And it all runs at least on a base of open source. ARM has over the years changed. Very early, it didn't know about open source and didn't care and wasn't interested. Today, it has changed to the point where it was about a month or so ago, we announced some new features in one of our new ARM64 architectures. I think it was 8.3, 8.5. I keep getting confused which it is because I hear about them all day long. But it was a new pauth extensions. Literally, within days, we drop patches for the kernel. And it's at the point where that feature in the CPU isn't even going to hit silicon for another two years, and there's already patches in the kernel to support it. So, and then that's not even the product getting into your hands. So reality is it's probably another six months after that. At companies like ARM, open source is so fundamental that we do work so far in advance of you even getting it because that's what our customers demand and that's what the right thing is to do. And that's how deeply embedded open source is in many companies. I will put an asterisk next to that. There's certain parts of ARM that don't believe in this. I don't particularly want to talk about them today. Um, but at my division, which is the Central Engineering Open Source Division, is one of the largest in ARM. And it's been growing steadily over the years. And it's really important because it's important to customers. It's important to the um, OEMs who build devices, and it's an it's important right thing to do, and I don't think there's any stopping it. Open source is an unmovable, unchanging force that is going to eventually take over everything. The only question is, when do you go and join the party, and how effectively do you join the party when you do? Thank you very much, and uh, uh, Bunny, you didn't have the chance to say anything yet, but I think your perspective is uh, very different because you're not working in, in a, a big company. You, you, you uh, like, I think you have more like ideas and you just like start, start them like uh, uh, Carsten uh, years ago, I think, but you, you continue this. So what's your, what's your impression when you hear all of that? Like where do you see opportunities for openness and what, what, what's the take for you on it? Why, why, why are you so excited in, in, to work in, in the open? Yeah, um, sure. Um, interesting. So I'm, I'm glad you asked us that, you, that not all ARM is on the open train because, you know, at some point in time, I was going to say, like, at some point in time, I have a feeling I'm gonna, we were going to have a big uh, sort of war in court with ARM and their patents in the open hardware space. and. Uh, you know, architectural stuff. Because, you know, it's been impossible to make, make an ARM open hardware implementation because all the patents and, and 
everyone's accumulating patents and patents and patents, and now it's like risk five. Some are like, oh, please don't bomb me out of existence. And then, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so um, in terms of like open, I guess there's maybe the two points. I'll, I'll try to make it quick. One is that um, from the standpoint of hardware, um, there's a there's a saying that someone ha has that any technology is that sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic or something like that, right? And the problem is that when technology becomes magic, it becomes religion, right? So you already have these sort of ritualistic things like genius bars that you go to where you bring like your sacrificial device which has your whole life in it and it's not working. You pray to the god of the genius bar and maybe he gives you a thing back to you that you can then get. But you know the thing is it's actually these are all made by humans at some point in time. It's not like some divine being named Steve Jobs had just like, you know, like popped into existence and like it was incomprehensible to mere mortals, right? But, the, but there's, there's an advantage to these companies that try and convince you that's the case because they make a lot more money um, selling these things to you instead of letting you repair it yourself, upgrade the battery, fix the battery, let you use your phone for another five years or something like that, right? So um, to me, a lot about openness is just, um, like you don't have to be a hardware person um, necessarily. I don't insist that everyone has to do that, but you have to not feel trapped by your hardware. Like, so if you ever want to hit find the exit to the room, you, 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 you feel like you had too much of the cooler, you gotta leave the religion. Like here's the trail of breadcrumbs you can pick up, take yourself to a freer pl place if you ever need to get there, right? That's kind of open, open at least at this point in the harder space is just getting there to that point. We don't, ha we don't have the ability in open hardware yet to fully build and replace an open source phone, for example, but at least we have the trail of breadcrumbs to maybe get you there at, at some point in time. The other thing that I guess I would, I would bring up from the like the open side that is really helpful is that it, it's, um, it's a really, because when you can have conversations about the technology and what you're building, you can actually do very quick validation with the community that something's gonna be there. So like, you know, I, I really um, like Mitch's story about liking the TV be gone. It was a thing I built for myself. And it turns out like 15 years later, I'm like, you know, building and people still want it. You could put a room full of Harvard MBAs together and have them think for like, you know, a month and a half and they would never come up with this idea Right, because it's just something that you, you would come up with and then validate with the community. It's not obvious to these people, right? And this, so there's many classic examples in, in the world, like, you know, for example, Betamax versus VHS. Uh, how many people here you know, on the top, how many people remember Betamax and VHS? Okay, yeah, it sort of, sort of dates you at a certain age. So this is, there's, back in the day, we used to have these tapes that we used to record videos on, and we actually had to go to stores to rent videos and didn't download them online. And there are two formats, one was called Betamax and one was called VHS. Betamax was by Sony and VHS was by JVC. And um, in Betamax, Sony had put a lot of money in and developed it and they made a very close format. And they wanted to sell it and they had a lot of really smart people put it in and they were very proud of the fact they had high quality and it was a compact format, right? And then JVC actually almost wanted to kill the project inside and a couple of engineers on the inside like just in the dark of night like pushed the product out and JVC says, well, you know, we don't know, but let's license it to some other people and see what happens, right? And then RCA picks it up, and they say, like, actually, what we hear the market wants is a four-hour runtime, right? So we're going to do a mod on the standard to do a four-hour runtime. It turns out people didn't care about the quality bill. They want to record the whole Super Bowl, right, without having to swap tapes. So that was, like, the really important thing at the end of the day was to be able to record full broadcasts and have runtime. And so then RCA made the improvement. It went back into the license pool, and then that got licensed to like dozens and dozens of other manufacturers and beta was just like killed by that, right? So at the end of the day, you can be a really big corporation with a lot of like insight and a lot of marketing and a lot of push to get maybe do your B2B initiatives because you know one customer, you can know them really well. But knowing the consumer market, knowing that TV Be Gone is going to be a thing that people are actually going to want is not something that's obvious. So having this open conversation and being able to get that validation early on, build the community and have the community make improvements, check them back in the base, and then build them out further is like a really important part of that process. So I think we are at the end of the, uh, of, of the panel. Um, so uh, initially the idea was that we share about the future, but I think we already shared about the future. We, we see in what direction we are heading um, uh, on, on all sides. 
Yeah, but uh, um, uh, we have still three minutes, and um, I would like to open uh, the floor uh, to a question here uh, from the audience. Yeah, if, if there if there are questions, yes, Mishari, okay. Hello. <laughs> Is this open source? Okay. So, um, thank you. Uh, it's been a very interesting panel. Um, now, what, what I've been seeing um, um, as a trend, right, is that, yes, some things are getting more and more open, right? We have open source Linux um, getting embraced by um, uh, big companies, IBM, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, I feel that uh, it's, it's I don't know if it's just me, but I feel that like it's getting almost schizophrenic, right? Because on one hand, we have like these uh, the, uh, getting em uh, embraced and the open source being um, um, being embraced, and on the other hand, on the other side, we have cloud providers which are creating closed ecosystems and uh, and patents and um, you know even companies like Facebook which are completely closed uh, but uh, actively involved in open. So I'm wondering is is the net result, are we getting more open or, or is it actually a red herring where, where the openness is hiding the fact that we are all getting driven to a closed ecosystem that we will be very difficult to come out of? Any takers? I, th I think there is an interesting sort of, um, you bring up a good point and there's an interesting question that's going to come up in terms of the algorithms versus the data, particularly machine learning. The actual like code that runs the models and inference engine is not as valuable as the data sets themselves, right? And so you can have open license code and we can all fork it, all sorts of stuff, but if you can't get access to the massive data sets to train these uh, engines, it's going to be worthless, right? And so there's, there is a bit of a, a danger that we are walking into. And also, you can have plenty of open source infrastructure, but then the user accounts and the data that's inside the cloud, inside Google Drive, whatever, is really where, where it's at, you know. And these are these are the real things. And so and so as a kind of a community, you do bring up a, a very big concern that I have. Um, is that maybe we we are just playing into some larger corporate strategy to just leverage our ability to help build up their war chest and they just accumulate data users and they just put a different license on some things that's not functional through a sort of a quirk of the system and then we end up essentially weaponizing an ecosystem that we're hoping to demilitarize at the end of the day. Okay. Can I make a comment too? Um, I, very, very good point. And um, I, I, I think I, I am optimistic that, as I said, you know, open source will win out in the end. And we are moving in very, very strongly at the moment in the right direction. Um, for my future forward-looking bit, I was going to say that open is really, really important but privacy is also very, very important. And at the moment, we're going through a phase where we've got companies collecting massive amounts of data centrally. We're building massive machine learning models. We're spending weeks and weeks of multiple GPUs to build these models. Um, and um, that, that's where the power kind of lies at the moment. I think we're slowly starting to see the pendulum swinging with regard to privacy back into the right direction to regain our privacy. And it's great to see Tim Berners-Lee's project around um, regaining privacy and regaining the internet. Um, but um, the, the models that we spend hours building, we are also now starting to try and share that as well. So our computer vision models. Um, um, we saw the, um, the the IBM AI. Um, what was it called? AI, an area to publish AI models. Um, we're developing similar stuff for um, publishing pre-built AI models, and to try and share that openly. So building the outcomes as well as the open source that drives those um, the those outcomes. Yeah. So, so uh, just a quick one, right? Since uh, I represent a corporation, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm from an IBM perspective, right? I think uh, 
what, what from an IBM perspective is that, you know, open source, like you said, right, it's, it's, it is the future, right? And companies like IBM look at our open source as a future for ourselves as well. And, and then, got it, yeah. So the, uh, if you look at all the platforms that I mentioned, right, whether it's cloud or AI or blockchain or quantum, right, everything is based on open source or open technology, right? And this is a core part of our strategy. It is fundamental to IBM's uh, innovation, right? And, and I think that alone tells you that, you know, when you look at open source, most organizations, when you look at the core platform, the plumbing, is where I think open source will make a critical difference. Where IBM comes in, and where we you know, try to add value, is on the places, the peripherals, where we have the last mile, incorporate the last mile capabilities around what an enterprise needs, right? From a scalability, from an availability, or reliability perspective, right? That, that's where we add the value, right? But at the core of it, right, it is going to be open source in the future. Uh, I, I, believe that okay this is the future it's we hope it will go in this direction it all looks like it but like we'll find out right the future is arriving so um, um, I would like to I think there are many more people who would like to talk to you so um, uh, will, will you be uh, staying here for a few a little bit more time so if people have questions they can also come to you I'll hook you here anyways I guess right um, uh, Graham, you have a talk uh, um, also in the AI track, yeah. So you'll be um, available for uh, further discussions. Um, and Carsten, you will also be here um, and giving a talk in the hardware track on Saturday, as well as Bunny. We'll see you again in the hardware track. So more opportunities to catch up and get together. Um, I think we couldn't answer all the questions. There's much more as always, right? But it was very, very interesting here. It was a very nice panel. So thank you very much to all the panelists, um, and thank you very much for joining us.